Hey everybody, this is Richard and welcome to another episode of Fatal Error. This show began as a research project for me to understand how entrepreneurs and founders think about the climate emergency and figure out ways in which all organizations, not just non-profits, can become climate positive. Today's guest is Eduardo Gomez, Chief Product Officer and Co-Founder of Emitwise. Emitwise enables companies to measure and monitor their carbon footprint so that they can reduce and offset their footprint. Eduardo tells us about his studies, his experience of growing up in a generation where climate change is front and center, and the motivations behind starting Emitwise. Let's hear what he has to say. Now, what's your background? Where are you from? How did you start this company? What's the company doing? You know, back. Cool. Yeah. Um, so originally, I'm kind of a mix between uh, Chilean and, and British. So actually, I was born in London, uh, but I spent a lot of my education in Chile. Um, and there, kind of, I, I finished secondary education and ended up going to the University of St Andrews, um, where. I, Actually, interestingly, I applied for sustainable development, but ended up switching towards um, more of an economics focused degree with international relations. Um, I saw kind of my strong suits laying more in, in economics, um, you know, IR, politics. Um, and obviously, well, there's that kind of looming um, notion that economics is more of a, you know, is a more of a marketable degree than SD. Um, so I ended up switching. Uh, but that didn't really kind of take away from my passion towards sustainable development. Um, it was always kind of front of mind for me. Um, in my in my master's thesis, I I wrote about uh, the implications of of climate change and water security specifically mm -hmm. on on political conflict uh, at an international level, um, but also in an in international level within South Asia. So really, kind of looking at um, what, what are the effects of water security? Um, you know, how can that impact food security? How can that impact kind of the lives of people and, and, and terrorism, extremism? So for um, someone so, like me who's not sort of well versed with that term, what do you mean yeah. by water security? Water security. So specifically this idea that there's, um, there's a finite amount of water in this planet, um, from fresh, fresh river, uh, fresh from rivers, from glaciers, um, and this idea that, <clears throat> you know, as climate change intensifies, um, you know, uh, the, the availability of water um, across these, uh, across many regions um, will start to really rapidly diminish. Um, so both the groundwater, uh, but also kind of the water from the glaciers. Right. And you see this kind of um, interesting phenomenon, well, not interesting, very depressing phenomenon where um, kind of, uh, you know, the water starts flowing a lot quicker because of the glacier, you know, the increase in, in melting of glaciers. Mm -hmm. um, so you're kind of, you know, getting flooding from above, but also flooding from below from the, you know, from the sea level rise. And, and countries like India, countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan are, are very much uh, vulnerable to this, this phenomenon. Okay. Because of the, the long history of conflict in the region, I thought it'd be interesting to examine how that uh, phenomenon, how climate, uh, climate change and water security specifically might affect uh, conflict. And uh, my findings were quite damning. Um, but uh, yeah, it's almost an example just to show um, Kind of this was always really front of mind for me um but then i kind of uh you know when i graduated i i entered uh the world of tech um, um i was i was always interested in innovation and in kind of this concept of of you know using technology to um to combat the issues you know that we're facing across right. the world whether it's gender equality whether it's climate change um you know the there are many um so, um, you know, given my background in economics, um, <clears throat> I joined a company um, that uh, actually uses AI to help with primary research. Um, essentially, they kind of created this primary research platform, um, connecting investors, um, investors with, with, with their primary research and doing it in a way that's much more effective. Okay. Um, and what, what's ki what kind of work are you doing at this stage? Are you doing at that stage? Yeah. At, work? at that stage, I was more into sales, uh, but I wrap, you know, and, and while I think I was, I had, um, you know, some good skill sets for that. 
Um, I wasn't quite happy in sales. I think um, I, I was kind of investigating what are the, are the other career opportunities I could go into. Mm-hmm. Um, and I eventually kind of turned to product management. Um, so, so I became the first product manager at this company, um, this, this startup really. Um, it's a startup that had been going on for two years. I, you know, I was there for a year. Uh, so it really kind of grew quite, quite rapidly. Um, by the time I had left, there were over 100 employees at the company. Okay. And I joined when we were in kind of mid-20s. Um, so it, it, I kind of got to see this rapid period of expansion and got to kind of grow with the company, um, with the startup. That's cool. uh, but, but where I kind of experienced the most, the most growth, I think, is when I entered into this product management. I started to understand, um, uh, you know, the skill sets that were required. Um, I thought, you know, the level of empathy that's required to understand the user needs and wants, uh, you know, fit well with what, you know, I've been doing um, across, throughout my life. Um, so that, you know, quickly became apparent to me that product management was something I wanted to get involved in. Um, moving on kind of uh, towards the end of my kind of time at uh, the startup, um, you know, a series of events happened, but essentially my co-founder, I think you, you spoke with, Maudo, um, long time friend actually we we were um, we are very close friends in in Chile um, and he had done you know he had started up his own company um, uh, taking him to San Francisco uh, in California um, so he ended up working on that startup for for a few years I think um, turned out to be quite successful uh, but he kind of realized a similar conclusion that I did uh, you know it, that that space, uh, sort of that startup was was called Researchably, and they were in the pharmaceutical spaces. So they were kind of creating research uh, or or facilitating uh, the process of of finding research for for pharmaceutical big pharma pharma companies. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, similarly to to me, I kind of uh, you know he realized he didn't want to be in that space. He didn't want to be learning about pharma uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, what what he really cares about as well is is climate change and and using technology to solve that issue and that okay. crisis. So you um, put your heads together at some point and decided well, to do something together. <laughs> well, that's where the coincidence came. So he, you know, he, I remember him calling me uh, one day. You know, we'd we'd always kind of stayed in touch, speaking like uh, at least every month since uh, since Chile. Um, and he called me, he calls me one day telling me like, oh, you know, I think I'm going to make a big move here. Uh, I think I'm going to leave researchably. I'm actually thinking of going to London, um, uh, to work on one of my friend's startups. Um, you know, do you know anywhere, <laughs> anywhere I can stay? Do you know anyone who has a spare room in London? Like I'm going to be going there pretty soon. Um, fortunately we actually ha- ended up having, um, a room in my, in my, house okay. available so it was, it was perfect uh and that room was becoming available the month he was coming so so yeah kind of uh you know he can he ended up moving in um and and yeah and um you know shortly shortly after he moved in um we were doing some, kind of some brainstorming we we're always you know since since high school since uh, secondary school we we're always uh you know brainstorming of ways of how to kind of solve um, solve or at least tackle the, cl- the climate crisis um okay. so one day we sit so down you, on the couch. You, you're sort of one of the people who've grown up to some extent yeah yeah with, i don't know how old you are sorry but I, <laughs> so i'm yeah, yeah yeah of course i just turned 23 so still okay very young. so you, throughout your high school education this was something you were basically growing up with yeah okay yeah. Yeah, That's exactly, exactly. I remember distinctly one geography class when I was in primary school. Uh, they played a they played a documentary um, on climate change, and ever since then, you know, since I knew about the issue, I just I couldn't really stop thinking about it. It was always at the back of my mind. So it was, yeah, something I definitely grew up with. Um, I think that's something um, specific to our generation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's interesting. I was talking to somebody. Um, as in one of these interviews, with Gareth, he's a coach nowadays. Um, he's he's definitely not of your generation or even of mine. <laughs> so he's like a bit older. He was in, in yeah. sort of in, in university in the right. early nineties, I think, something like that. And 
it's interesting how he was talking about he grew up with these issues basically being very different to how they talked about today. The issues back at the time were more like conservation, pollution. So still, yeah. still sort of important, but less catastrophic, right? And they were more about, they were more about, oh, animals are going extinct or this is impacting our health in cities and stuff like that. But sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, carry on. Um, so I think you were getting to like... Um, oh yeah, so kind of where it took off, yeah. Mauro. I remember we, Mauro and I ended up sitting down and, and you know, and thinking, okay, right, we're not going to get up uh, from this couch until we've, we've come up with at least a few ideas. Um, I think we said five ideas and we'll call it, um, but they all have to be related to climate change um, uh, and in, in kind of in tackling the, you know, the issue that is climate change. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think we, we came up with, you know, a couple of good ideas, most were bad. Um, but, uh, you've got to start somewhere. Um, I think that, that key, that key night, like that night was, was quite key and instrumental in, 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 in actually kind of getting the ball rolling. Um, okay. um, and then, yeah, I mean, it, it starts off, it starts off quite quickly. Uh, we start iterating on this one particular idea, uh, this notion that, um you know the the estimations that people have of their carbon footprint sorry not that people that companies have of their carbon footprint um <clears throat> is are, are widely inaccurate um so we were kind of trying to think of you know what 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 are the trends in technology what can we kind of uh you know what are the trends that we can exploit to um to then help solve this issue the you know this issue that that the estimations are, are wildly incorrect. Um, so we thought of, of <laughs> this kind of IoT type startup um, where we'd be you know, planting sensors everywhere and getting the ground truth of, of, of kind of the scope one and two emissions, um, you know, putting sensors directly, um, you know, on, on, on energy meters, on, on you know, pipes, uh, combustion pipes, et cetera. Okay. Um, um, so, so what yeah. I guess we're kind of like getting to the core of sort of what your company yeah. does. So, yeah. what do you do? It, it's emitwise, right? Am I pronouncing that exactly? Correctly? Emitwise. Okay. Yeah. So, what what is the product exactly or the service that you guys have come up with? Uh, what sure. does it? You know, if I'm a company, what do I come to you for? What do I get? Um. So yeah, the elevator pitch is essentially. Um, Companies come to us um, um, because they're having difficulties, um, you know, monitoring um, or even just calculating their carbon footprint. Essentially, what we what our software provides is a way to, um, you know, automatically measure and monitor your carbon footprint um, in a in a continuous fashion. Okay. Um, so we integrate into their various um, internal databases so that can be, you know, ERP software, you know, like SAP. Um, it can be point of sale software. It can be, you know, CRM. Essentially, anything that has, um, you know, has indicators and, and data on on the resources that they consume and, and uh, you know, within their supply chain, etc. Okay. Um, so, what's a typical we, customer that maybe you and you don't have to mention names if that's not okay. Yeah. But like, what's a typical sure. customer that you might work with? Like, are we talking a software company or like retail? Yeah. 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 So, um, so no, they're, they're, they're large corporations. Uh, so we help large enterprises, um, you know, monitor their, their carbon footprint. They tend to be, um, sort of consumer facing, um, sort of, yeah, consumer facing companies. So, you know, think, um, FMCG, I uh, think, you know, Unilever, Nestle, those are kind of the, you know, I like to think the key, um, key target customers we're, we're looking at, but of course, you know, um, our, our aim is to really help every every company in the world be able to easily monitor and manage and, and essentially ultimately sure. reduce their carbon footprint. Um, and then this is obviously a process of iteration. On the one hand, uh, you know, your heavy industries are, are, are kind of, uh, are, are now getting increasing pressure from regulations um, and from investors. Uh, so that's kind of where the pressure is coming from that end. Um, they're interested in, in, in compliance-based solutions, mostly in reporting, um, 
and ensuring that you know the, that the emissions that they produce or contribute to um, comply with these regulations. Um, on the other hand, uh, you have the more consumer-facing companies, which is the, which are the ones that excite me the most because um, they uh, they seem to be a lot more um, active in their in their in their um, in their actions towards uh, combat. Why well, they're getting a lot of pressure at the moment from different sides, right? So. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Consumer-facing companies are getting a lot of pressure, you know, from from consumers themselves, um, internally from their own from their own labor force or prospective employees. Um, I think actually I was uh, we posted an article was it yesterday um, on Google. Um, they so a group of one thousand Google employees actually um, sent a letter to the CFO. Um, um, asking them to or calling for them to um, uh, stop all funding on um, you know policy groups or any organizations that are that are um, basically preventing climate action or, or lobbying against climate action. Yeah, they were in the news recently, Google, weren't they? Um, about yeah. their funding of I can't remember which groups, um, but certainly yeah. some anti climate action lobbies yeah. in the states. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 to be to be fair to Google, they, I mean they've they've been carbon neutral since two thousand and seven, so they have uh, on have some they? side, you know, okay. yeah. So they they've they've done they've they've made some important strides, um, but still, I think it's uh, it's unacceptable for them to be um, you know funding organizations that that you know helped convince Trump to pull out of the Paris Paris Agreement. Okay. Um, I think that's. Yeah, so that's... yes, um, but so okay. Just to pick on that a little bit, when you say right. Google have been carbon neutral from 2010, right? Yeah, uh, 27 or 2007. Yeah, 2007. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that mean? So um, it means that um, from the emissions that they actually help contribute to, because it's not, it's 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 natural that companies are going to actually. Um, end up uh, directly or indirectly contributing to the to the, the to the release of greenhouse gases into the mm-hmm. atmosphere. It's natural, um, but they uh, be, you know the, this idea of carbon neutrality is that um, they have you know from those greenhouse gases that they have directly or indirectly contributed to, um, they have been obs- offset um, by carbon sequestration programs. So that can be okay. from you know, planting, uh, planting trees, you know, uh, rainforests, uh, planting seagrass, you know, in the water, underneath, underneath, underneath the water. It can be, um, you know, carbon CCS or carbon capture and storage. Um, essentially, as long as the emissions that they release are counterbalanced by the emissions that they help take out of the atmosphere, um, they, are, they become carbon neutral. Okay. And that's 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 our mission. That that's really what what it comes down to. We we want to help accelerate this this global transition towards okay. carbon neutrality. So you're you're going for companies who want to know their carbon uh, footprint. You're helping them yeah. understand what that is, so that then they can offset Provide the oversight. right amount. Um, um, not necessarily just offset. I think there's a lot reduce. to be said. Yes. Uh, first, reduce as much as possible. I think it's important to identify the the areas that you're really underperforming in, um, and to really tackle you know increase with energy efficiency. Um, it's always the first resort should always be to reduce where you can reduce. Um, next, you offset. So, just to go back to something you said at the beginning, sure. um, where you said you know one of the reasons you and Mauro picked this idea was that you yeah. sort of saw or thought that a lot of the estimations were off the mark, right? Yeah. So where a company is already maybe they're let's say they're you know they're super committed to sure. be carbon neutral, they're not managing because they're not really managing because their measurement is off. When we when you say that that you know the, the estimates are off the mark, what what sort of are we talking about here? Are we talking like, you know, off the mark by ten percent or off the mark by five x? Have you any like, have you seen yeah, I mean, any the, any sort of like really massive differences or what have yeah, you? Yeah, I mean the, the differences can be ma- can can be really quite ridiculous. They can be plus a hundred x um different hundred x. Yeah, so it's, okay. it's quite uh. So why is that? Because 
because um, is it you know they don't know what to measure they're measuring it wrong what how can you be yeah so I mean wrong right so it can be you know several several different uh, reasons um, you know sometimes they're missing some some essential greenhouse gases so if you look at the um, you know the oil and gas industry um, uh, there you know there can be methane uh, methane releases. Uh, methane is 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 um, is much more powerful than CO2 uh, in terms of their greenhouse warming potential. Um, so so really the impact the, the you know the carbon emissions that are that are released um, and if you're missing those those methane emissions can be quite significant. Um, but it comes down to several different factors. So so it can be that missing actual emissions uh, because you're not measuring them um, at the at the at the end point. Um, it can be because your emissions factors are wrong. Um, so let me kind of clarify what an emissions factor is. Um, an emissions factor is essentially used to create, um, you know, say one kilogram of a, uh, you know a glass bottle into a carbon equivalent. So um, essentially, for uh, for that glass bottle, uh, they'll look at the whole value chain. They'll look at from the production, um, you know, to the transportation, to the disposal, um, and they'll estimate estimate how um, how much green uh, how many how much carbon how many carbon emissions um, or carbon equivalents were used to create that that one bottle. Um, okay. So, so I'm guessing a lot of companies don't take the whole chain into account. They might yeah, or 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 the you know or the um, you know yeah or or the for example the emissions factor that they use for the glass bottle um, is wildly different from the actual bottle that they produce. If that makes sense. Right. Okay. So so they'll so they'll take into account maybe that emissions factor is looking at transportation from Switzerland to the UK. Whereas, uh, you know, maybe the one that you're producing is is actually from Chile to the UK, uh, and that can really have a massive effect, drastic effect. How 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 can something like that happen? With um, well, because I mean, you don't have emissions factors for every single product that was produced or every single process that exists across across the world. Um, so what you need. Okay, okay. So here we're talking about like a company buying a glass bottle for use in something else for example and exactly. the data they have available say off the internet <laughs> for example is an approximation right or else it's yes. not accurate for it, it it's it's not accurate for in terms of where yes. they're actually getting their bottle from right yeah or, yeah it doesn't take into account the whole the whole value chain um or it doesn't match it doesn't reflect the the value chain that the emissions factor for that glass bottle Okay. Right. Yeah, it's, it gets a little. So, scope three. Um, are you familiar, firstly, with the kind of the term scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions? I've heard them mentioned a lot recently. Um, yeah. But it'd yeah. Be good yeah. to hear your take on on them. Sure. I think it, it does really help clarify because it it can get when you start looking at the, the scope three side of things, it can get really muddled up, and and it's useful to kind of make this distinction off the off the, um, you know at the start to to then kind of understand what the distinctions um so very briefly um scope one emissions are are direct emissions um from from you know a, a either processes um or or products that you own and control um so for example if you think about if you own a um, you know a fleet of cars uh, the direct emissions coming from the combustion um of the fuel are the are, are you know scope one emissions um right similarly similarly um you know an oil and gas company producing oil the emissions coming from the production are scope one emissions um then you're looking at scope two emissions um now those are indirect emissions uh but their emissions coming from um you know for example the ut the utilities that you purchase so the electricity that you consume okay um, so, for example, if if you have um, you know if you have ninety percent, uh, if you consume ninety percent renewable energy, your scope of two emissions are going to be very low. Whereas if you can if you consume electricity that is predominantly produced by coal, uh, they'll be much higher. Okay. So if you're, for example, a milk production company, yeah, your scope two emissions are, for example, the cost of 
electricity to run your plants and keep keep the sort of like things running right? well yeah well the 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 cons the use of that electricity so how 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 many emissions use, were produced yes. and using that electricity exactly exactly um whereas your scope one is for example the what's produced by your delivery fleet taking exactly, the exactly. cows back and forth the milk back and right. forth and so on and yeah. so forth. okay and to stay with uh the milk analogy or the milk production analogy um uh, then the scope three emissions are literally everything else that you indirectly contribute to everything else. So, um, uh, for example, the you know emissions from uh, the procurement of that glass bottle. So that mm -hmm. glass bottle that you use, um, you know, the production, as I said, you know, the the waste, the transportation, all of that. Um, so Does that all, also includes stuff like, for example, your advertising, right? Everything. So everything. If you're putting up a billboard is the cost of printing and shipping that. If you're yep. advertising online, in theory, you should. The data centers that you run, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Perfect. Um, so, so as you can imagine, um, you know, that scope three, you know, the scope three emissions are, are quite large, especially for consumer facing companies that, that more than anything consume products rather than do the actual manufacturing themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so you, typically what you find is further down the supply chain. So closer to kind of that end point where the consumer, um, you know, uh, actually has the product uh, closer to that end uh, scope three emissions are much higher than scope one and two but closer to kind of the you know the, the top of the funnel really where where everything is uh, you know where maybe the you know minerals are extracted for producing um, everything yeah that's that's where the bulk of the scope one and two emissions can be found in general in general um, yeah it makes sense and, it makes sense and, and there's been a lot of focus for scope three emissions um because um because essentially i mean you know scope one and two emissions aren't the whole picture um you know while you're not uh you know directly producing these these greenhouse gas emissions you still you should still be held accountable uh from you know for for the indirect emissions that you produce although in theory in theory right if if everybody took care of their scope one emissions exactly everything yeah. should fall into place that's completely now, correct course, that's not really realistic um in the yeah. short term at least or even maybe medium term in the way things are yeah. going currently but yeah but the, one of the best ways of dealing with your scope three emissions sounds to me like using a trusted supplier Right. Exactly. Exactly. Who has their or, scope one and two emissions in place? Uh, well, being that's exactly right. in the right way, right? But even then, there's complications because okay, so you're able to help your scope one or your tier one provider, um, or or at least engage them to become more sustainable. Uh, but what about their provider and their provider and their provider? Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a, yeah, you know, it can be a very long. Of course. Of course. Yeah. It's, <laughs> So um, it's it's a very it's a difficult problem when it comes to the data and uh, getting hold of that data uh, when you're really looking at the scope three side of things, but you know most companies actually help other you know large enterprises measure their carbon footprint um, really don't do a that a, that great of a job with scope three emissions. And in fact, there are um, you know there are very very few software companies that are, that have even try to attempt scope three emissions. Okay. Um, so what about yourselves? Yeah. So how are, you, how are you guys doing? Like in terms of your yeah. measurement, offset or reduction? Um, how are we how are we specifically helping helping our customers? No, no, no. Time? You as a company. Oh, okay, um, right. Like you as a company, are you? Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that you're you're tracking your own thing. Yeah, right? I mean, you've got you 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 have to walk the talk. Uh, we're actually in the process now of developing our own internal emitwise dashboard, emitwise emitwise dashboard, um, um, for for tracking and monitoring our carbon footprint. Um, as you can imagine, you know, being a, a startup that started just over six months ago, it wasn't really top of the our priority list, but um, but yeah, one of our key values is really to kind of, oh you know, yeah, you know, walk, um, walk the talk. So um, you know that that's something that we're we're currently undertaking now. 
Okay. Especially, okay. especially as this kind of, so we're actually undergoing a sort of a product iteration um, phase, uh, developing the V2. Um, so it makes sense to to now do you know now do that. Perfect. Okay. Um, so you said you said um, you've been doing this for six months now, right? Um, yeah. How Since around May time. So, so, so just to get into sort of the, the kind of, because this is interesting to a lot of people, including myself, but especially people maybe who want to start companies in this space, right? Well, right? Um, yeah. Are you funded? Are you, you know, profitable? Maybe not yet in six months, I maybe not. But like, what is your sort of like, what is the business looking like? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we received our, I mean, so for the first few months where, <clears throat> Uh, we are running from we are running on competition funds, uh, so uh, we are lucky enough to kind of attract um, attract interest um, across competitions within the UK, pri primarily university competitions, um, uh, but also uh, you know there are some other um, competitions we're involved in, um, the Royal Academy of Engineering being one of them. Um, but so that was kind of our first, uh, you know, that helped us get off the, off, off the road. Okay. Um, um, and, and, and when we, you know, when we had enough legs to really go out and raise money from investors, <clears throat> that was around, um, you know, end of August, early September time. Um, so we ended up, um, we ended up raising at a $2 million valuation, um, pre, pre, pre seed, um, and uh, and that only took well, that took us around three three or four weeks. So it was a very quite a quick process. Um, we were lucky we're lucky now to um, to be working with um, a very supportive um, and and helpful investor. Um, okay, that is a quick soon. process. Two to did yeah. you say three to four weeks? Uh, yeah, three to four how weeks. Did that, how did that happen? <laughs> To be honest, I mean, I can't take any credit for it. My uh, my co-founder Mauro um, led and, and managed that whole raising uh, raising process, fundraising, and and he yeah he should be taking the credit for that. I think uh, he did an amazing job. I think part of it is um, you know he had the experience from from fundraising for his other startup. Um, so so yeah, he, I th I like to think he know he knows how to uh, to go into a room with. Sure, but what's, what's attractive to investors here, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and bear with me for a minute. I have sure. issues with investors and sort of like the investment kind of ecosystem in general. Right. Because there's good cases to be made for certain types of investments that, you know, they, they promote perhaps the wrong kind of activity um, or wrong kind of economic sort of like growth. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and you know until recently you wouldn't get that many investors um investing in such a young company in this space so quickly even with even with with founders who have you know raised before and so on um what's been attractive to the investors that you found and and you know how how what's the pitch basically well i think at the end of the day um any software company that replaces what is currently done, you know, using Excel spreadsheets, um, you know, it has, has the potential to become, you know, uh, a pretty, pretty important solution. Uh, I think, I mean, if you look at other companies that have, that have been able to do that and replace, you know, what was currently done with Excel spreadsheets, you know, accounting software, I mean, you can draw comparisons. Um, but really what it, what it was for us is that, we identified a real user need, um, and and I think the timing was very important as well. I mean, 2019 was quite momentous when it come when it came to kind of climate act. You know, you had um, extinction rebellion around the time, uh, really really kind of growing in prominence in, in London at the time we were, when we were raising. Um, you know, across across the world, there was there were there were um, you know movements. Um, and protests. Um, I like to think that, you know, I, and I'm fairly um, optimistic on this front. But I like to think that um, we're kind of finally turning 
turning the tide here where um, pressure is, is becoming so great, you know, from, from consumers to regulation to investors that companies can't ignore this issue any longer. Um, companies really um, now need to look at it as an opportunity, the opportunity that it is. Um, you know, sustainability can really become a competitive advantage uh, for many companies out there, and that's what we're trying to help them do. Uh, I think when the investors kind of um, identified that and really uh, resonated with that vision for, um, from our end. That sounds great. Um, just on a sort of purely personal level, I, I really sure. um, <laughs> probably won't. This won't make the edit, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I was involved in a startup like yeah, uh, quite a while ago that was trying to do kind of similar to what you guys are doing now like not exactly not exactly in the way you've described it but a fairly sort of um it was the point was about measuring what you're doing right it was more consumer oriented rather than enterprise and so on mm -hmm. but um we went to so many obviously there's like a, a thing where many variables right of like maybe they didn't like my face or you know <laughs> a bunch of things there but the response the interest was so non-existent at the time of like we would never invest in something like this um so so that's that's a good that's a good uh, thing to see yeah uh, yeah I, I think it's a shame small thing but I don't mean that your company is a smooth thing, but in a sense, even if it's like a few investors here and there, but it's, it gets the ball rolling. Yeah, of course. I think, I think what's important is to really kind of uh, not be selective, but really kind of try to find the investors uh, that are most relevant to the business that you're trying to grow, right? So if, if you're building a software company, you know, try to start the conversation with, um, you know, VCs that, that, focus and specialize in investing in software companies you know if you're if you're building a, a social impact uh, business you know try to reach out to the to the investors that that focus on social impact businesses um okay so I, yeah. I have <laughs> i have to go pick up my daughter in like 10 minutes sure, so, sure. so i'll ask you one last thing um okay what what are your you know what are the kinds of things that you'd like to see your customers do when they use your product? What, what sort of things are you, well, let me, let me rephrase that. You're, you're, you're helping your customers understand their footprint, right? What, are, hmm. what sort of things are you hoping that they will change and how fast can that change happen in, in their organizations? Um, I mean, essentially, so I think the first step that, that I made wise tries to help is, is to provide oversight, right? Um, is, is to kind of help with the measurement side of things, but our end goal really is to help them, um, identify the best and most effective opportunities for reducing their carbon footprint. Right. Um, so I guess, um, in answer to your question, I think what we'd like, what we'd really be, uh, and this you know, maybe something we, we we're looking to measure, but, um, you know, how many, how many targets, um, our customers set, you know, how many uh, mission reduction projects, you know, are they undertaking? Are they meeting their targets? Are they identifying the most effective, um, ways of reducing their emissions? And what I really hope our software is able to do for them is to identify, um, those emissions hotspots, um, you know, the real, the real spots where, where, they're underperforming against their industry competitors um, and where they can make the most, the most progress. Are you planning to have any kind of public leaderboard? Of, public you know, leaderboard? You know, yeah, public yeah. Well, I, I think it's important. Their, their emissions by this much, you know, like this brand has done this, has made this improvement. Well, that's a good, that's a good idea. It's, it's actually not something I've considered before, but I think there's a lot of value in, in trying to gamify the process and try to kind of, uh, uh, you know, make it make it competitive. Um, it's something that we've been thinking in internally within an organization. So, um, you know, can this office be more sustainable than this one? Uh, can this sustainability management team, yeah. you know, 
you know, be, um, you know, help produce more. The, but also for, for, you know, that scope three conversation we were having before, you know, if I could go to your sites and see actually who is really, um, let's say really giving a shit about this stuff. Like, yeah. Yeah. Should I buy this brand or this brand of tea? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, of course it's, it's, I think that's interesting. I, I think it's also very important to be focused on, on the product that you're trying to build. And I, it sounds to me like that company is more kind of, uh, focused towards, you know, helping consumers have greater understanding. Um, and while that's definitely a company that needs to be built, um, and it's actually, you know, I've, I've, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of ideas surrounding that kind of B2C area of what we're yeah. trying to build. Um, it's not what we're focused on. Fair enough. Thank you very much. No, uh, no problem. Thank you for listening. Please visit fatalarea.blog to join our mailing list and help support our community and project. And if you like the music, please check out the Happy Quartet on Bandcamp. That's it for today.